Hi there, and welcome to the Love or Leave the Law podcast with your hosts, Adam Olette and Casey Berman. Hi, everyone. Casey Berman from the Love or Leave podcast uh, with my partner, Adam Olette. Say hi, Adam. Hey, everybody. We've got a special guest today, and I'm going to have Casey introduce him. Yeah, thank you again for joining. We are so happy to have you on the Love or Leave the Law podcast. Um, really appreciate you taking time to uh, to listen to us and uh, to be part of the community. Uh, we got a really special episode today. Uh, we have Malcolm Kushner, uh, author of over 11 books, uh, on the line um, and in video here, depending on, on whether you're listening or whether you're watching. Uh, Malcolm uh, is uh, is an author of over uh, 10, 11 books, including some uh, some real top ones that you might have heard of, Presentation for Dummies, Public Speaking for Dummies. Um, he's also written a lot about humor. Uh, he's a public speaker himself. Um, he helps uh, executives and organizations, uh, does a lot of speaking for them um, around how to inject humor, not only into uh, into their speeches, into the writings they're doing, but also how to kind of inject humor, whether it's about attorneys, politicians, or others, into uh, into their mindset, um, into the work they do, and to kind of motivate employees and to and to laugh. Um, so we're very happy to have Malcolm here. He's he's a lawyer. He left the law, and he's going to talk to us today a bit about how he left the law, and really about his uh, career and give us some tips and tricks into. Uh, how he's done public speaking as well as writing, because I know when I speak with a lot of attorneys about what they want to do, they say, you know, I'm great at public speaking. I really enjoy writing. How do I do that beyond the law? So we're going to delve into that. Malcolm, welcome. Hello. Hello. So happy to have you. How are you doing? Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you. So first off, we got a ton of questions for you. Um, But the first one is maybe just take 30, 60 seconds and tell the audience um, a bit about yourself, your background, how you left the law, and, and sort of what you're doing now. Well, I left the law. It goes with what came before. My background is in speech communication, BA and MA at uh, USC. I taught uh, freshman speech when I was getting a master's degree. I was going to stay for a PhD, and then I saw the people ahead of me were driving cabs in LA, and I thought, hey, I drove a cab in New York. I'm not going to step down in the profession. (laughs) And I didn't like L.A. I wanted to live in San Francisco because you can hear from my accent. I'm a New Yorker originally. San Francisco combines New York City and L.A. So I thought, "Ah, I'll go to law school. I'll figure it out. It'll kill three years. You're right. (laughs) uh, Then I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. I only went to law school because I wanted to be a student and live in San Francisco. Right. But I did well. My father said, look, you got to try it. So I practiced two years. The last year was at, you know, your basic mega firm, international corporate law firm. I used to say the firm was so big, they couldn't fit all the offices on the card. They opened up a New York <laughs> office while I was there. They, they didn't even put it on the card. Right, right, right. At the time, this was the early 80s. At the time, they were one of the three U.S. firms with a presence in China, which you couldn't really practice law. Wow, yeah. There were three firms that had a hotel room where they did construction deals, and this was one of the firms. But uh, not surprising, I didn't really like it. And and I think what drove me out of it was uh, the dead parrots case. I mean, I, I was hired for the Labor Department. I get which had just started and I got mainly lent to commercial litigation because they didn't really have that much labor work. Right. And uh, the uh, the senior associate I work with, who was really nice, but the most serious person I ever met, I, you know, right. she never cracked a smile. And we, we had a lot of foreign airlines as uh, clients. And, you know, somebody somebody shipped some Paris from South America. They got crushed or suffocated. Ooh. And. You know, half of them died. So, okay, you know, because people would say, what do you do at work? I say, you know, crush cargo cases. They go, what's that? I go, well, somebody shipped the parrots. So they died. Somebody has to pay these people, either the the airline or the insurance company. I said, I represent the airline. I want the insurance company to pay. So, you know, that we go on for years and hopefully the insurance company pays. But in this particular case, the senior associate was like really serious, really smart. You know, one day she comes and she goes, I have an idea. I go, what? She goes, maybe we can do a deposition of some of the surviving parrots. That, that was, then I said, that's it. I'm out of here. Oh, I, to this man. day, I don't know. If she was joking, that's the first time I ever heard a tell right. joke. And I thought, now, this back- is the moment. I'm gone. 
my. Now, Malcolm, quick. So, <laughs> when, um, when, on a serious note, I, I'm curious because a lot of people who are listening here are laughing right now, but, they, but many of them are thinking, should I leave the law? Should I, how do I, or do I stay in the law? How do I make this better? What was, besides that, that whether that was a joke or not, which is a, the straw that broke the camel's back, what else did you know where you said, you know what, this just isn't a fit for me? What, what signs did you see? How did you know that, that you really were sincerely going to leave the law? No, it, it was a tough decision. I'll tell you that I'm sure everyone who's thinking about leaving the law confronts the same issue. It's like nothing pays that much. And that's what took me that's what me, took me that long. I mean, I only practiced two years. It took me two years to leave the law, which for me right. was a long time. I never wanted to be a lawyer in the first place. Right, I just right. wanted to be a law student. But you know, and then I thought, you know, I I just couldn't stand it. It's you know, it's so much pressure, you know, you don't you know, not hard to eat, you get stomach aches, just dealing with these weird, arrogant people. Yeah. It would be great to be around smart people, and the smartness was fun, but, like, the arrogance was just unbelievable. Yeah. And the and pressure, the fiduciary, okay. the fiduciary duty or the deadlines, what pressure really got to you? Um, yeah, deadlines was one, and then, like, you know... I don't want to say, I don't want, I'm just coming back to me now. You know, when you, yeah, write yeah. Something, you write something and you know it's okay, and these people are just trying to rip it apart, you know, see, you know, coming up with a synonym that means the same thing, so it looks like you didn't do something right, you know, that type yeah. of arrogance, yeah. you know, like the, yeah. uh, oh, I'm a senior, so, oh, I'm the partner, you know, you're a jerk, you know, that, yeah. the whole mentality, it's kind of, I'm thinking, yeah. like, I don't In need line this. With so, how'd you leave? You know, cold turkey. I just took, I just left. I hadn't been spending much. I saved up a lot of the salary at the time. And then, you know, you know, I went from making big bucks to like making next to nothing. And then, you know, that's what most people don't want to do. Right. <laughs> and, and I understand. Plus, I was lucky. Well, she wasn't my wife at the time, but <laughs> but my girlfriend's a doctor. So oh, yeah. when we got married, that helped. That, helped. <laughs> that can't hurt, well, right? How did you, you know, must have been a bit of an ego blow. I know, you know, identity as an attorney wearing a, you know, being in a high rise with a, with a blazer and all the, all the, the trappings that go with being in a lawyer. You know, I, I know attorneys that I've worked with who saved money. They're in a great spot to leave and they still don't because it's this, this identity as being an attorney. How did you, I know you didn't want to be an attorney at the beginning. So was it difficult for you to kind of break away from that identity? It was it not the actually I kind of didn't and I'll tell you why it's it's not the identity of an attorney that bothered me it was like basically not having a job and I didn't know what I wanted to do and then I yeah. thought okay all these people I went to grad school with are communication consultants and that was kind of what I really liked but I thought okay I don't want to do that it's too competitive I, then I thought okay I'll be a humor consultant they can refer business to me I'll just specialize in the humor aspect of communication. And the the attorney identity I kept was I would was going around downtown San Francisco, going to you know like the phone company, big businesses, yeah. and I I I would I'd go on a humor consultant, I'd go like you know get out of here. But I put on my three piece suit and say, well look here's my old card. I this is where I used to work. It was like everybody knew the firm. They go, oh you're a lawyer. I go, well I'm a humor consultant now. And then they they that would get me in the door. They go, well what's that? And then when they'd let me explain, then. I started to get some clients who look like, oh, you could talk to our PR department. Oh, yeah, we have a whole, we do all these community speeches for like the power company and the phone company. That's like, right. We can add some jokes to them. But it was like when I initially tried to just get in, not saying as an attorney, I was like basically, I guess for a humor consultant, maybe it's good. But as a business, I was laughed out of the office. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> so your advice at this point in the conversation is if somebody wants to leave the law, save as much as they can and date and then marry a doctor, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, Casey might want to add that to his uh, repertoire of go. teaching. Uh, that, that's, I think is that's that going to be part of it? Okay. That's it. No, well, that, that, we've that's got a comedian on here. We have to have some fun with him, right? I mean, come on. That's fun. Uh, that's great. Actually, if, if, my, if I may interject a religious thing here, is that allowed? Oh, yeah. Please. Anything's allowed in this podcast, yeah. no problem. Well, you know, when I was 
when I was told my father, I, the one who wanted me to go to law school in the first place, you know, I'm Jewish, okay? It's like, oh, you got to go to law school. Oh, you got to try. It's like he was like pushing the whole time. When I was telling him I was going to get married, I said, hey, I got some good news and some bad news. He goes, what? I said, well, the bad news is she's not Jewish. And he says, what's the good news? I said, she's a doctor. <laughs> so you got half the right, half right. So they should have been at least somewhat happy, right? <laughs> That's great. Cracked half a grin. That's good. That's good. Malcolm, one thing that, that, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that, that actually after you left the law, you still promoted yourself as an attorney. And I tell the joke kind of that I say is, you know, if you wear glasses uh, you don't have to wear glasses, but if you wear glasses and if you say you're an attorney, you know, people in the non-legal world will think they're going to think you're smart automatically. They're going to think you're they don't really know what attorneys do. They just Absolutely. think attorneys are smart. Right. And so you can many people say, well, if I go into a job interview at a non-law job, they don't like me because I'm an attorney or there's a scarlet letter. But actually, in many ways, you can use it to your advantage. Oh, absolutely true. And, and, you know, now that I think back on it, initially I was pushing the attorney thing to get in. And now that I think about it, it's only in the last couple of years that I started just saying humor consultant because I have all the books, like people yeah. know who I am. The other thing that you may have heard of is the cost of laughing index. That's in the Wikipedia. I started yeah. that. Um, but ah. it's only in the last few years I'd say, yeah, I'm a humor consultant. And I'm thinking I've been doing this like over 30 years. I think to like, you know, 20 plus years, I would introduce myself. I said, oh, I'm Malcolm Kushner. I'm, I'm the attorney turned humor consultant. I'd always yeah. say attorney first. Even it's only in the last few years I decided, OK, I can stop saying I'm an attorney. And you're right. right. I mean, people always think like, oh, you're an attorney. It's like I keep people keep saying, <clears throat> what'd you go to law school for? You didn't practice. I'm thinking, are you kidding? This is like better than karate or judo. People, <laughs> people are like they give you like this deference. There's respect, yeah. There's they, respect that comes it, along with even it. Even attorneys yeah. who know you don't know anything because you hardly practice. Like, oh, <laughs> you did it. You went through law school and you passed the bar. It, yeah. It's great. It's great. No, I, that's a huge point because so many uh, people that I work in leaving the law feel that it's this noose around their neck. Uh, how can I go into a hiring interview there? You know, they don't even want to talk about being an attorney. And and I really think, like you said, I mean, done right. It can be a great way to position yourself. And and just the the anecdote you said about the wearing the three piece suit and saying you're an attorney, they they gave you that. That was the end for you. Oh, absolutely. Because I remember initially trying it without that. And I couldn't get in anywhere. Interesting. Interesting. So how did you one thing I would call it is your unique genius uh, it's something at leavelawbehind.com I write a lot, which are those those skills and strengths that that we're really good at. And, you know, a lot of attorneys have trouble finding it. They they uh, if this could be very interpersonal like you, it could be public speaking or just kind of riffing jokes. It could be, you know, there's all these skills and we really want to find that and use that as sort of the to inform what uh, t steps you take to find, uh, you know, an alternative job. How did you find what you're really good at? Well, it's funny. I guess the, the thing I like the best is the public speaking. And that was that was an accident. And it was from the Bar Association. One of the things I did when I became a humor consultant, <laughs> I'm still a lawyer. It's like I started writing a column for the local legal paper in San Francisco. I, I it was a like humor in the law or something like that. Yeah. It wasn't like a humor column, but I would interview attorneys and judges about how they used humor and find examples of things and so forth. And then Somebody from the uh, State Bar of California like, read and called up and said, hey, do you, would you like to speak at the annual convention? And I thought, yeah, sure, why not? And then I went, hey, I was a speech major. And then I realized it went great. Everybody loved it. And I thought, then I started investing. I said, oh, you know, these people make a living just at public speaking. So then I really started pushing that. And all along, I've always done the writing and the speaking. But I, the speaking is fun. That's you know, yeah. What are, what are some tips that you could give our audience on how they can become better public speaking uh, speakers? I mean, you wrote the book Public Speaking for Dummies, and uh, tell us what your top yeah. tips are for how to, lawyers can utilize the idea of public speaking to grow an audience, to grow their law firm business, or even get into a, a new business and maybe do public speaking as a profession. 
Okay. Well, number one is, well, a lot of, of lawyers are good speakers. And whether you are or not, you, you need a place to try out your material. You know, you always see all these like top name comics, like during the week, they're performing at these clubs you'd ever heard of, because even the best comedians have to try out the jokes in front of a uh, live yes, audience. Right. And yeah. you need to do that with a speech too. You don't know what works until you try it in front of people. So whether you're a great speaker, and especially if you're just starting and you need a place to try, Toastmasters is great. There's really no other place where you can get like a, a friendly, non-judgmental audience who wants to help you and it, they don't care how bad you are. That's where you can practice getting good. And, you know, this to I, I, I'm not a member of Toastmasters, so I have like no reason to push it. But that's, you know, you need an audience and that's what that's, that's great. What it exists for. And, you know, they're all, they're around the world. No, they're you everywhere. Can't yeah. In yeah. Without finding a tripping over a Toastmaster <laughs> chat. Um, yeah. The other thing I, I like to tell people is, you know, this is my personal take, you know, for people who are, suffer from stage fright and stuff. Yeah, I, I always say the, uh, the it's a sliding scale. If you if you match the needs of your audience to your message, if you have a hundred percent match, you don't have to worry about stage fright because I think stage fright people are always worried about. Oh, mm. I'm not those television preachers on Sunday morning. I don't have like the great body moves and I have the eye contact and I, I'm not like I'm not like a polished performer. And then people get nervous. My example is if if you're if you're a uh, Jonas Salk, I say you remember me. I cured polio. I have a new cure for cancer, so I have the credibility to say it. I'm talking to the cancer ward. You know what? I can stand on my head. I can mumble. I can, like, look backwards. I can burp while I'm talking. You're going to take notes. That's a 100% right. match between the audience, what the audience wants to know, and my message. So it's a right. sliding scale. The further down you go, if it's, like, zero and zero, like a lot of speeches I see in Silicon Valley, like, I'm the CEO of some company and I'm talking to the user group and I'm just talking about how great I am and how great my company is. And I'm the user. Like, yeah. I want to know the product features and what you're going to do for me. I couldn't care yeah. less. Yeah, I mean, in you. human nature, yeah. Yeah. human so nature is really good and have like great slick body moves. So yeah. that's what I tell people. If a lot of times people give these speeches. They talk about what they're interested in. Nobody cares. You, you start with your audience and the closer you can get it to what they want to know the less they care about how polished your performance is. Interesting. And when you realize that, you do, and attorneys are great at research. Do the research. Find out, yes. you know. I was going to say, it, it requires that upfront preparation to know what your audience is after. Absolutely. And the more you can give it to them, the less they care about your delivery. And it's the <laughs> delivery that's what, that's what makes people stage frightened. Well, do you advocate uh, using an outline, notes, what, what, how do you do public speaking? I mean, I, I use a very brief outline, and I usually don't even look at it, but it's there, and I've done a lot of public speaking, clearly not as much as you, but I have it there. It's kind of like a security blanket for me, but uh, that, how, how do you do it? What do you advocate? Yeah, that's exactly what I do, and a lot of <laughs> – that's what I've never understood. A lot of people will talk about, oh, that person is so great. I remember they used to talk about that Hillary Clinton when she was in the old days, when she was in the Senate. She like testified. She gave a speech for three hours. She didn't use one note. That's a, which I, I guess that's a major accomplishment. But to me, it's like uh, if you have notes, even if you have like fake notes, I would always bring notes up. So it looks like I prepared and thought yeah. about the audience. It's yeah. like I don't have any notes. And you don't know that I did anything. Yeah, well, I've studied public speaking, and, and there are some teachers that will say you shouldn't use notes. There's others that say write the whole thing out, and I think really it's a personal choice of whatever makes you comfortable. I mean, there is a, a spiritual teacher that I, I'm a fan of for a long time, and the first time I ever saw her speak uh, in person, she had everything written out, and she's been doing this for 30, 40 years. And so did did I care that she was had all these pages of notes and she was – almost reading them? No, because I was listening to her message. And, and what I was going to say before uh, was that human nature uh, is they don't really care about you per se. They, they care about what you can help them with. They care about themselves. And so exactly. this is the problem with marketing uh, in small businesses and, and lawyer marketing is that we think marketing is, is about us. People don't care about you 
They right. care about what you can do for them and how you can help them, and that's uh, that's something that's is, right. that I think uh, is a takeaway from exactly what you just said, Malcolm. And that is, uh, it's not about you; it's it's about them. And how can you best serve them through your speaking to them and, and help them in the in the long run? Right. As a general rule, people say, "Yeah, you shouldn't." And again, these are just general rules. The the bottom line rule is like what I said before. You're talking to the cancer ward, and you have the cure for cancer, and you have the credibility yeah. for yeah. people to say that you can read word for you can do whatever right. you want. Right. Nobody cares. Uh, as a general rule, you know, people always say you shouldn't read word for word because it's a barrier between you and the audience. I always bring an outline, and then what I usually do is don't refer to it. But like, hey, I'm getting old. Occasionally, like I'll forget where I am, and I'll go. And, and, and people are always afraid of this. They, the audience doesn't care. It's like, oh, I, 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 I lost my place. Let me look at my outline. Nobody cares. And they go, oh, we're glad he brought his outline. You know, yeah, right. I mean, it, He's from the, the last 20 years, if you look at every speech that pretty much every president that's been in office in the United States has given, they've got teleprompters on both sides. They're yeah. reading it. They're literally <laughs> reading it. All of them do right. it. And so... What's the there? I don't, you know, it's for me, it's whatever's best for you in the moment and, and do whatever you can to get in front of some people and speak to them and get them interested in what you're doing. I, I, I've used public speaking to really further my law practice over the years by taking stuff that I knew that I knew the, the audience that I was talking to could use and utilize in their lives. And man, that was such a boon for my business and really helped me to get over that hump of, well, I don't have enough clients to, man, I've got too many, I've got to hire extra staff. And so I know that public speaking can be something amazing for the uh, lawyer that has a small or medium-sized firm to get people interested in, in your work and, and learn. That's really what it's about, isn't it, Malcolm? It's really about yeah. teaching people stuff, not about preaching to them. Right. And the other thing about public speaking to, to groups like, the, you know, the, the Rotary Club or your church group or school, you know, getting into like community groups to build up like a small practice is, you know, a lot of this stuff is you don't have to be like, you know, Oliver Wendell Holmes. It's like, you know, it's routine legal work. Why, why should somebody go to you and not another lawyer? Right. They know you. There's a personal connection. Once they see you speak, you can talk to them in person. They like right. you. Like, OK, I'll go to you. Well, right. for, for me and in, in my, uh, my life and stuff that I've studied, there's books that have been written that says when you get out and speak or you r record a video or anything like that, you go from someone not knowing who the hell you are to uh, building a trust almost instantaneously through a half an hour, 10 minute, 15 minute speech where they say, you know what, this guy is a lawyer, this lady is a lawyer, they actually yeah. know what they're talking about. Uh, if I hear of someone needing something like what their practice area is, I want to be the one to refer them. And, and that, I think, is really the where the rubber meets the road in, in building that trust to get someone to either use you or refer you uh, clients. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. There's, you know, there's a personal connection. That's right. I want to, Malcolm, where does humor fit in all this? Um you know, a lot of people we talk to are not very happy. Uh, some of them are suffering from depression. Some of them want out badly for the reasons, you know, at the law firm, they can't stand the people or they're doing their practice, but they're just not bringing in the clients. They're just, they got, they got bill problems and so on. We see it on both sides. People want to stay in the law and those who want to leave. Where, where, it's easy to say, just laugh and smile and be happy, man. But, but where does humor fit into this? How, how can it? Okay, well, the, the easy part to the question is where it fits into the marketing, into the speech. Uh, yeah. Because, like I said, okay, a lot of law practice is the same, so a lot of people giving speeches is the same. So if you can insert, like, a, a few pieces of, of humor, it does – again, your, your job isn't to communicate that you're a comedian or you're hilarious. You're not. You're a lawyer. You just want to show that you have a sense of humor, and which yeah. is great because the – yeah. Uh, the stereotype of lawyers is that they're arrogant and don't have a sense of humor. So if you give your speech, you <laughs> tell them something useful, and it's like, and like, hey, that guy, that makes sense, and hey, and that guy, the guy had a good sense of humor, especially, and especially if you like, maybe say one or two things that are self-deprecating, like, hey, that guy isn't even an arrogant lawyer. When I need my will done, I'm going to that guy, or I'm telling that friend. So it's, uh, so that's the part, and and that's, that's where people say. Like, 
and this is where I spend most of my time in my seminars, it's like, okay, that, that makes sense, I get it, but I can't tell a joke. So I say there's lots of simple non-joke techniques that anybody can use, um, you know, a funny quote. And you tie it to a point. You make an analogy. Lawyers, the key to legal thinking is analogical ability. Anybody yeah. that takes the bar that can do that. It's like, well, as Woody Allen once said, like here, you tie it to your point. As as whoever, pick a funny quote, tie it to a point. It's yeah. as many points with them as you can think of. It's unlimited. It's just your ima analogical imagination. That is so simple. Personal, That's huge. That's huge. That's great. Personal stories are great. Every lawyer I know loves to tell war stories from work or even from back when, a million years ago when they were in law school or when they were in college or their weird relatives. Everybody's got these people you know <laughs> you do think can't tell a joke and are totally unfunny. You've heard them at a bar or a social occasion or some event telling one of their like weird stories. Yeah. You can't laugh at it. Okay. Analogize it to a point. You can't tell a joke. You can tell that story. You've been telling it for years. Tie it to a point. And if you think about it long enough, you can tie it to a point you're making in your talk to the Rotary Club or the community group that's trying to build up business. And that's how you stand out from all the other people that are going to be doing that. Yeah, that's and great. I think uh, one of the things that someone could do if they're looking to do exactly what Casey says and interject some humor is get your book, Come Back for Lawyer Jokes. And I love the subtitle, The Restatement of Retorts. I l absolutely <laughs> love that. But one of the things they could do, Malcolm, is they could buy your book and take one of these lawyer jokes, lead with the lawyer jokes and, and the retort in here and make people laugh. Just get people loosened up because yeah. people do get... Uh, a little uptight around lawyers because we we do have uh, some power that we we have over people in the community and we are respected still for the most part. Mm -hmm. So I I love uh, that idea and I'm going to have to buy your book because I'll probably lead with some <laughs> lawyer jokes. So the and the other well, book <laughs> that you have I think that's uh, a lot of our audience would be interested in getting is the clearly the presentation and public speaking for dummies is is right in line. Uh, with uh, what we are talking about today, but the ultimate lawyer quote book, words of wisdom and humor, that too. Anytime that we can interject something that gets yeah. people loosened up, uh, and that's what you do. I mean, this has your, been your career since you left the law. Well, I, people always say, hey, why did you become a humor consultant? How do you do that? I say, well, you have a background in communications. You go to law school, and <clears throat> of course, along the way, <clears throat> Some of you may not remember this, but you have to be on the gong show. That oh, went gosh. off the air. In the yeah. But I was on the third week. It was on the air in 1976, and I didn't get gonged. So that's oh, wow. What, what, oh, what, wow. What were you doing? What was the presentation? What, I, uh... I was the world's only plant act instead of an animal act. I had a fern that jumped through a hoop, shot a plant out of a can, and saw the plant half. Have you Plus to an old great. lady from Santa Monica who imitated Sophie Tucker, but you can't beat old people on the gong show. Well, yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> it's true. I used to well, watch you know, it. Yeah. Go ahead, Kate. Uh, sorry, Adam. I was going to say that, uh, first of all, you can get all of your books at kushnergroup.com. That's K-U-S-H-N-E-R group.com. So all of Malcolm's books are are available there. You can go through. Uh, he's got all the, the covers and the titles. They're really funny. You can check it out with a synopsis of, of all of them. But I think, you know, what I liked about what you said was it sort of takes the pressure off because I know a lot of pressure and I enjoy public speaking, but I'm not a real comedian. And so to tell a joke, my kids will say, daddy, tell me a joke. I, I don't really know a joke. It's kind of high pressure to tell a good joke. But if you do the analogy, if you pull a quote and then tie it to the point, I mean, I was just feeling kind of relieved. Like it takes the pressure off having to tell the joke and you can still be funny. Yeah, absolutely. This is the saddest thing to me. I've seen a lot of times people, you know, these executives, especially in Silicon Valley, they'll start with a joke. Nobody will laugh because the joke has nothing to do with anything. It's pointless. <laughs> and then they'll say, well, I'm never using humor again. I go, no, don't. You can't tell. Well, number one, if you can tell a joke, don't just throw in your favorite joke. Again, analogize. Tie the joke to a point because then you're not twisting and left field. <laughs> People always disagree about what's funny. I can name 10 comedians now who make billions of dollars a year. Half of them, you'll say, they're not funny. So people always disagree about that. So if right. I tell a joke that, that and, it, and nobody laughs and it makes no point, I'm like twisting in the wind. Everyone's going, oh, this guy's bombing. 
But if it makes a point, people will recognize that they might not laugh, but you made a point. So you're not just twisting. Yeah. In the end. But more importantly, if you can't tell a joke, there's lots of other simple things you can do. You know, another one that I like that people never think about is cartoons. They always think, oh, I'm not using PowerPoint. How can I show a cartoon? I go, say a cartoon. I see people all, all the time. You're in your office. You go, hey, this is a great cartoon I saw in the paper today. And you, you say it. You say what the caption is. And people laugh. And go like, tie it to a point. Okay. Pick a cartoon that has something to do with you, what you're thinking about. Hey, it's like a cartoon I saw in the New Yorker. Blah, blah, blah. Of course, here's you know, a little caveat. Don't, don't be a jerk like I was and try and take it too far. I would say, oh, yes, here's a cartoon I saw in the New York Times because I wanted people to think I was smart and read the New York Times. And at the end of the speech, someone came up to me and says, you know, the New York Times doesn't print cartoons. <laughs> I, I <don't> <laughs> Whoopsie. <laughs> Whoopsie. Oh, God. Then you're a schmuck there. You know, it's funny you say that because my daughter is just reading. We got her the collection of the peanuts, you know, from year oh. by year. And she will read me the, you know, the frames and I'll laugh. Like it is funny when you're, exactly. you're right. A cartoon, you don't need to see it visually. You can, yeah. you can hear it. Yeah. Um, that's you great. Something with a strong visual image, describe it, say it, and then tie it. And you know, you God, there's cartoons on every subject is all the things you're talking about as a lawyer. You know, it's Adam talks a lot about this, about and, and we've talked in previous podcasts and talk more about how to differentiate as an attorney, how to automate your systems and so on. And, you know, this is great feedback, really, for how to differentiate when you're when you're schmoozing, when you're networking, when you're speaking somewhere, you know, throwing humor in and just kind of giving that that public impression, I think, can can be the difference between someone, like you said, going to you for the will or not. Yeah, well, it, it, it creates likability. I mean, that's yeah. what you want. It's a that's reserve right. of goodwill. That, that's what you want. Yeah. yeah. Well, part of Malcolm's what, unique genius um, is that he loves to speak to lawyers. And so if you uh, are having a retreat at your firm or your firm is thinking about doing a, a, a presentation, you can reach out to him on uh, kushnergroup.com. He really loves that, and he's very good at it. And you clearly can tell that the guy is funny and, and he can hold an audience. Uh, Casey, do you have yeah. any parting thoughts or last questions for Malcolm? We're running out of time. You know, Malcolm, I just – yeah, just one minute. I just want to get your thoughts on um, – you know, a lot of attorneys say, well, I'd love to write a book. I'd love to speak or I'd love to do this, but I'm so busy. And one advice I give is, is if you want to do something, volunteer in it. Don't quit your job and go become a novelist or something and so on. But any tips for that lawyer who wants to become a novelist or wants to go speak? Um, you know, I always say do it on the side, volunteer, kind of take the baby steps. But any other thoughts around that? Oh, well, <clears throat> for for writing, the thing, the thing that's – okay, the, the two hardest things to do are, number one, get started. That's – everyone wants to do it and then they never start. And then – it is hard to write. You know, you're facing the blank page. Hey, it's hard to do that writing a brief. It's even harder when you're writing your great American novel. And I always right. tell people, especially since you're a lawyer and you're used to dictating, this, it's much easier to edit. This is my best secret. It's much easier to edit than to write. So you're you're driving the work. Well, not you're driving. You're taking, well, you're in a big firm. You're getting driven to work or you're in a little firm and you're taking public transportation to work. You have these this free time, sort of. Start dictating your book, and then yeah. pay pay a typist to type it up, and then you can you're editing. You're not writing. Yeah. And then you've started. You've done it while you had time, and it's much easier to edit than to write. Oh, you're right. Actually, and, and that's exactly what I did with my book. I well, I was never a, a very good writer in general, but I said, let me just get my ideas down on paper. And then I found an amazing team of editors, a company that does editing, and they did pretty much 90% of, of the overhaul of it. Readability, the ideas, putting it together, maybe you should do this, do that. And so when I got done with it and I read it, I'm like, wow, this turned out amazing. And it's about using, utilizing people to help you to finish it. And so yeah. transcriptionists <laughs> are online. They, you, know, you can get people to do this at an hourly rate or, or a per word rate, and it's actually not very expensive. So I love it. Just get started. Get it down yeah. on, on paper, and there are people to help you to finish it, to finalize it. Yeah, Malcolm, Adam wants me to write my book for Leave Law Behind. So fine, Adam, I get it. I'm going to do it. Get busy, Casey. Jeez. 
Malcolm, that's great. It yes. really is great advice. You're totally right. Um, we're going to close. We want to uh, uh, end the episode, but any parting jokes or things yes. for us to giggle I'm about, Malcolm? Yes, yes. This please. sounds like a setup because I was going to say, <laughs> my favorite joke from the book of Comebacks for Lawyer Jokes, there's a really small chapter at the end, which is nobody's ever done before. It's called Positive Lawyer Jokes, right? Ah. Because every, lawyers are sick of the, the, the negative jokes. And I think... <clears throat> The way we can combat it over the long term is to start making jokes about positive aspects of law. And my favorite joke in the whole book, this should be a poster in every law firm in the country, is uh, how many lawyers does it take to change a light bulb? I don't know. How many? None. If it's Abraham Lincoln, Mahatma Gandhi, or Nelson Mandela, then the light comes from within. <laughs> oh, get you right here. Get that you is right. good. That is great. Start That's telling great. I love it. If people... They'll start telling doctor jokes and accountant jokes. They make more money than us anyway. <laughs> Maggie, you've been great. Really, yes. I, I, you made us laugh, and you also gave us some great tips. So I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, thank for, you for being for here podcast. with us, definitely. Oh, thank you. Happy New Year. Happy, Happy New, Year. New Year to you. Uh, everyone, again, from the audience, uh, I'm Casey Berman with Adam Millette. Uh This is the Love or Leave the Law podcast. We are so happy to have you. Uh, check us online at love or leave law um, Feel free to down check us out on iTunes. We're on YouTube. You can even download the transcripts if you'd rather read it. Um, we got many more episodes coming back. We hope to have Malcolm back in the yeah, future. Definitely. Um, check out kushnergroup.com for all of Malcolm's services as well as all of his books. And um, we just really appreciate being part of the podcast. And we got more yeah. episodes coming down the line that we hope you like. Adam, what I missed? That's it. Thanks, everybody.